the chairman of the Brevard Veterans Center uh, Council and um, one of the members of the Veterans History Project. Today is the 7th of January, 2021, and we're delighted to have the chance to interview John Erskine, a Marine veteran who uh, will tell his story of Marine service and, and the actions he went through in two tours in Vietnam. With me today are Carl Miller, uh, like John, a member of the Military Order of Purple Heart, as well as the Marine Corps League. Carl, we want to thank you for bringing John in to get this interview and make sure it happens. Um, we also uh, are at the Veterans Memorial Center Library, so those who look at the, listen to this and see this video in the future will understand the circumstances here. So John, before we get started on your Marine Corps life, can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and what you thought about the military as you were growing up, and was it always your pet plan to join the military? Uh, as a young man, everybody, of course, in my neighborhood was a World War II veterans at the time when I grew up. So it was like kind of the natural thing to do. You were, you know, being a patriot and American. Yeah. What part of the country was that? I was from uh, Boston, Mass. Really? I was born in Newton, Massachusetts. Good. I, I <laughs> was born in Boston and grew up in Needham. Okay, very right good. next to you. Yeah. yeah, great. So anyway, a lot of patriots in Massachusetts, right? <laughs> oh, very patriotic. In fact, uh, a lot of Marines lot come of from Marines Massachusetts. Well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just about everybody I knew went in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Yeah. So you joined in 1966. 64. 64, but went to Vietnam in 66. Right. Did you enlist? Because the draft wasn't that heavy in 64. Oh, no, I enlisted. You enlisted. As soon as I got out of high school. Very good. Uh, so you graduated from high school and then immediately enlisted in the United States Marine Corps. Exactly. Okay, uh, and I, I guess you went to Paris Island or one of those places? Paris Island. There you go. After, uh, when did you get your orders for Vietnam? And can you tell everybody what was Vietnam like? Because you were there sort of before the big battles, but the, it was after the advisory period when we were really doing real combat in Vietnam. Yeah, there was a... It was a big difference between when when I got there in '66. It was early '66, January, February, March, April. Uh, there wasn't a lot of NVA activity. It was mostly Viet Cong, a lot of minefields. So it was mostly just track. We never would find them. We'd track them down, look for them, but we'd lose three or four men a day just in mines, mm -hmm. booby traps, whatever. And we never really made any kind of heavy contact because there was no, none. We were stationed in the Da Nang area at the time. Uh -huh. uh, we were more of a guarding force for the air base there, really. Mm -hmm. But you'd actually do patrols to go out? Of the yeah. Air to make sure to set up a barrier? To yeah, we, we were on, a, there were several hills there. It was 54, mm -hmm. 55. Mm -hmm. I was on Hill 55. And we'd go out on patrols every day, you know, search and destroy. And we'd very seldom find anything except the mine. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a... Uh, but yeah, you mentioned that you were wounded in your first tour in Vietnam. Yeah, Can you yeah. that day? Uh, uh, we were on patrol, and uh, I was pulling up the rear, and uh, and, and they, they went up this hill and climbed into this rice paddy, and uh, somebody stepped on a landmine. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, we, so uh, we had to, I had to set up a I was just a squad leader at the time. I was a corporal. and. Uh, I set up a perimeter for the choppers to come in and uh, threw some smoke out and marked the spot and whatnot. We got the guy, and just as we did, they hit us again. And uh, I caught a grenade, and was, uh, a rocket, it might have been a rocket, hit the end of my, it hit the end of my rifle, I think. And, uh -huh. and, and hit me, when it came down, it hit my hand, went down my arm and into my legs. And uh, But it didn't really like, being a rocket and having a shape charge in it, I guess that the explosion would go right by me, you know. And there's no shrapnel. a matter of inches were. It yeah, it, it, it just hit the end of my. End of your, yeah, yeah, wow. It, there was a, at that time it was an M14. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it, it hit the end of the barrel and just kind of ricocheted and took part of my finger and hand off, and that was about it. So I went back to uh, Chelsea Naval Hospital in Boston. Wow, yeah. And, uh, they uh, meritoriously promoted me to sergeant when I just after I got there. I, I really don't know why. And so. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do. 
So, <laughs> um, so tough they, guy. <laughs> so uh, they they made me the Marine liaison at the hospital when I uh -huh. became the ambulatory, and I took care of people, all the Marines' paychecks and whatnot, and transferred them to wherever I had to go. And I went down to the Marine barracks and uh, talked to the colonel down there. And, saw, and since I was from Boston area, I I asked him if there was any chance of being stationed there, you know. And I, I only had a year to go, I had to 68 to go, you know. So uh, I, he said, uh, yeah, I might have some openings, he says, uh, you know, if if you extend a year. Whoa, he put the know? old extension caveat yeah. in there. So being from Boston, I was a sergeant already. I'd, now, at this point, your your family lives in the area. Yeah. So have you? Are you married at this point? No. No. no you're no. a single guy still. No. No. If Marine Corps wanted you to have a wife, they would have yeah, issued you one. Yeah. What issue you want? <laughs> so, uh, where was I now? Uh, yeah, you're talking about the uh, down there. You're trying to get an assignment in the Boston area, but there was a. Oh was yeah, a caveat. So, he had to extend. Yeah, so so I, I said, uh, gee, sounds like a good idea to be stationed right here. It'd be great. Maybe I could get the staff sergeant. Who knows? So I, I went ahead and extended here, and they made me sergeant of the guard of the starboard side. So that, that was a pretty. I had my own private room. It was just ceremonial duty, funerals, wedding, and uh, weddings, ship commissionings, things like that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, spit shine stuff yeah. like that. So uh, things were going really good, and then late '67, uh, I guess a lot of us got caught up in it. All E5s and above were ordered to go back to Vietnam, mm. <laughs> and uh, I didn't believe it. You know. <laughs> yeah. At this point, how how egregious your wound had pretty well healed. Oh yeah, you, I, I got. You were then still combat qualified despite that wound. Oh yeah, because I got my this is my trigger hand. So yeah, but I lost my my finger. Uh, it didn't matter, and and the rest of it was all flesh, shrapnel yeah. wounds through okay. my leg. Wow. So no problem getting back physically. You know. I have to ask you: Did you ever regret extending? Oh no, actually. That's a marine for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> actually, I, I, my. My intentions were to slow. I was going to stay in the Marine Corps for life. Ah. You know, I, but uh, I figured I had a good chance just staying right there in Boston for a while and thinking about it. What I, you know, what I wanted. I was thinking of either going to embassy school or recruiting duty. Uh, uh, I'll, yeah. I'll have to tell you that uh, the uh, uh, Marine Security Guard program. I was in the Foreign Service, the State Department. I served in nine embassies and been in a hundred embassies all over the world. And Marine security guards are top flight. You'd have made a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, sorry to digress. But so yeah. anyway, yeah. off I went again. Yeah. Late late '67. I got there just before Christmas, I guess. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, they sent me to my outfit. I joined the Charlie Company, First Battalion, Fifth Marines, and First Battalion of the Fifth Marines. Yeah. Did what area was that in? Uh, it was I Corps Fubai. I, I was yeah. at a Fubai. At the time, uh, of course, I was a sergeant then, and uh, it was. I thought, you know, being there two years before, that uh, by '68 everything would be cleaned up by then. Uh -huh. you know? <laughs> and it was like ten times worse than exactly, it was the first exactly, time. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, they, I was up in Fubai, and uh, they they made. Me, I was a senior sergeant, so they made me uh, weapons platoon commander. Mm. Which isn't much of a job, really, because all your weapons are out in the platoons, so you just kind of supply them most of the time. So it was kind of a easy job at first, <laughs> but of course I got there January fourteenth, and Tet started two weeks later. Exactly. And uh, we were at the Langco Bridge, which was about fifteen miles south of Fubai, and the whole world exploded around us mm -hmm. on January thirty-first. We didn't know what was going on. We had no idea. They weren't attacking us, but you could hear it all around us. Was everything was going, you know? And uh, nobody knew where we were. We sat there for two or three days until some trucks came and got us. I guess a couple of the bridges were attacked on the way down. So they pulled us into Fubai. Didn't say a word to us. Just told us to grab all the ammo we could. This and that. This and that. And, and uh, I started looking around. I started seeing these CBS, NBC, 
you know, all these news crews. Yeah. And I said, oh, something really big's going to happen. <laughs> we didn't have a clue. And then somebody said, we're going to this place called Hugh. And I, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes called Hugh. <laughs> and I said, yeah, so it was Way City. Way City. <laughs> and, and so they, uh, we, we just drove up there in six buys. And uh, we got off the trucks and unloaded and everything. And uh, two five had already been there for a couple of weeks and trying to secure the uh, the new part of the city. And uh, they had blown all the bridges and whatnot. And, there, was, there must have been no intelligence up there at all. There was mm. MACV headquarters was right there. The intelligence and logistics. Of well, Vietnam. that goes back, John. That goes back to what you said earlier. We did not think that they had that kind of capability at that time. Exactly. We, we thought things were going to be better because there were at that time there were five hundred thousand American troops. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they went up there with two companies, hotel and. Foxtrot of uh, mm -hmm. two five, mm -hmm. and they went up there to take the inner city, the, uh, the the modern city they call it. There's a modern university, modern buildings. There's a treasury sure. building, State Department building, and whorehouses and bars, casinos, nightclubs, re fine restaurants, and it was kind of like a almost an hour and a half center yeah, before this happened. Before, but sometime during that month, they smuggled in about fifteen thousand troops. And trucks and explosives, all marked fireworks for the Tet New Year, and of course we didn't know this at all. That we, you know, we were, so when we got there, two fire have already cleared the inner city, but across the river, the Perfume River is about maybe half a mile wide, maybe more, to uh, the Citadel, which was the uh, yeah. the imperial capital of Way. You know, it was the ancient capital of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And this thing was like looking at King Arthur's castle. I'll tell you, it had a 50-foot wall all the way around this thing with these a moat in front of that going. And it's a mile square, you know. And these doors on it, just like they had in in, in those in the night days, those big wooden yeah. doors with the big wings on them, you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking across the room, and they wanted us to say, we're going to assault that tomorrow. And I go, they're out of their minds. Yeah. You know, but they were gonna first of all they were gonna send us straight across in my boat, straight across the river. We would never, never have got halfway across. So the next day they decided to send three companies down the river and come around to the southern flank of the of the citadel and uh, we, there were three companies I think Alpha Bravo and Alpha Charlie and Delta and uh, I think Bravo was still in reserve. And uh, we just walked in. <laughs> we got we got to the edge of the, the wall, and uh, we walked up to the, the door. The door was open about a foot or so, and uh, me and a few other guys went up there, and we opened the door and looked in. There was nobody there at all, hmm. you know? And so we fired a couple of rounds, you know? Nothing happened, you know? Everything was cool. So. Boom, I bring back a couple, couple of guys, we searched the area, checked it out. It was quiet as hell. There was supposed to be a Vietnamese Tiger Brigade waiting for us there, but they had screwed the night before, just left us hanging there, you know. And uh, we slept there the night. Nothing was going on, not a sound, you know. And uh, the next day, we just thought, they just had to walk. We told, they, at first, they told us, leave our packs right here, we just need some water. Yeah, my always said, we'll be back by nightfall. That was, uh, let's see, February 11th, I believe. And uh, they said, and so I told everybody, don't do it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> bring your packs, bring everything with you. you know? In fact, they didn't, didn't even want us to use 3.5s. The rules of engagement were, since this was an ancient, beautiful, imperial city of Vietnam, that we're not allowed to use any artillery, any airstrikes, no 3.5 rocket launchers, only small arms, you know, no mortars, no airstrikes, nothing, just a shirt and my M16. Talk about the proverbial one arm tied behind our back in combat uh, rules of engagement. <laughs> Ridiculous. So there's 600 of us, well close to that, I'm not really sure the numbers we had. We were kind of under strength before we ever got there anyway, but we we just went, they, Alpha Company went first, they walked 
right, and Delta Company took the left wall, went down that side, and we couldn't see them. There was a reflecting pool in between us, kind of like in Washington, D.C. type reflecting mm -hmm. pools, real long, real wide, and they were on the other side of that, and we were on this side, and on the main thoroughfare that went right through the middle of the city, all the way to the other end. So we just walking down the street, and then all of a sudden we get in about two blocks, and Alpha Company got wiped out. I mean, they got ambushed right there. They got hit with a triple crossfire. All their command structure was wiped out. All the radios are down. Everybody's down, you know. And every, it was complete confusion. <laughs> Nobody was in charge. <laughs> so, so we started to spread out on both sides, you know, and uh, we see if we could hook up with Delta on the left. So we got on this one street and we all started to spread out. And we had some kind of semblance of order. We, we were on one side of the street and, and uh, we did hook up with Delta Company and they were having a rough time against this wall over there. There, there was really a lot of enemy over there. But we were, it wasn't so bad at first. The more you seemed to be to the left, the more that we went to our left flank, the, the worse the enemy got, mm -hmm. you know. But we were more out to the street. It was pretty good, so they decided to do these, uh, there was a, the old World War Two just run across the street real fast. Uh, <laughs> and that's how we... Zigzag. <laughs> that's how we did it. We, we'd line up and uh, somebody would throw a red popper out there in the street and we'd take off running across that street and smash through the windows, doors, whatever we could on the other side and uh, we'd probably lose maybe 10 or 12 every time we crossed the street. You know, mm. and, you know we'd, we'd tell guys, please don't go back and pick up the wounded. Let them go. Go, you know, but the, of course, they're all friends, they're buddies, they're brothers. Yeah. yeah. They'd go back to help their buddy and, they're and they'd get killed too, you know. And, uh, and and that's where it was every day, every single day, until March the 10th, I believe. February 11th until March the 10th of 1968, the worst fighting in Vietnam of the entire war. Yeah, it was, um, we lost, uh, so I was weapons platoon commander at first. Then I took over third platoon as the third platoon commander. Because Lieutenant uh, Arnott, A R N O T T, he he got wounded, and uh, so uh, Lieutenant Nelson, our CO, asked me to take over the third platoon. So sure I did, you know. And I wasn't there five minutes, and I lost 17 men with a rocket attack. They hit us. I I don't, I don't know what happened. There. This guy got hit and he started screaming and they gave away our position and then they just nailed us with uh, maybe 20, 30 B-40 rockets all the way down the street. I thought it was just us, but it was all the way down the street they were hitting mm -hmm. us. And I lost so many men right there, I, didn't, I was really getting heavy, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, were these with those Katusha rockets, the, the multiple firing that the... No, Soviet no, these are what they call the B-40 rocket. It uh, was an anti-tank killer, but it was it was more like a law. Okay. About that size, but you know. But a lot of them. Yeah, they yeah. used to have like bamboo tubes, actually. Yeah, I think they yeah. shot them out of But yeah. they were mostly for the tanks, but they didn't have a lot of shrapnel in them. I mean, you had to be right in front of it to get... Unless it hit you, you know. Uh, but they came through the roofs and they were coming, oh, yeah. you know, and whatnot. And this kid got hit in the crotch and he started screaming, which gave away a position. And there was an alley right across the street, an alley. They were shooting right down the alley at us. And of course, there's nothing I, could, I couldn't do with them to shoot back or anything yeah. except clear out of that room. <clears throat> Just about then, we, we, had, we had all kinds of wounded. And then this other guy, James Blaine, he, he, got, he got wounded real bad and, uh, through the back and it came out his back. When it hit him in the shoulder, it came out his back, and he—he he was dead. But he was so good friends with everybody that we I kind of attended like we were still alive. And I saw a tank coming up the street, and uh, we couldn't—we could use the tanks, but we couldn't use the the 90 millimeter. You know, mm -hmm. they had to turn the guns backwards because we weren't allowed to use the artillery. You know, we could only use the 50 caliber, and. Uh, the tank was coming up the street, so I, I kind of motioned to it. I, I, you know, I, I said, I've got so many wounded. So I, I got the commander's a, uh, attention, and I, I, t I climbed up in the tank, and I said, hey, I've got about 15, 16 wounded, like, you know, and a, a couple of dead people. I, I said, can you take them out of here? You know? So he did, and just then this Antos came, and, uh, not an Antos, a uh, 
mule came by with a 106 on it, and boom, he got hit with a mortar right there. You know, so mm. we grabbed him and put him in the tank. And I, I'm sure you've all seen that famous picture of the tank with the dead man in the front. Yes. Uh, those were all the men from my platoon. Yeah. yeah those, in fact, uh, Life magazine. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, Carl knows a few of them. He's been with the reunion. He's met a few of these guys that were on the tank. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, uh, so the tank took off anyway, and we went back to work. And uh, we were there for another. That was, uh, I think, that was, uh, I think that was Valentine's Day. Mm -hmm. Tell you the truth, because I remember seeing somebody put a sheet out a window. But yeah. happy, happy Valentine's! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> boy, but, oh boy. And so we we, uh, we we finally got through the city, and uh, I think Delta Delta Company got hit the worst. They, they they only had like maybe 23 guys left out of the whole company. We had 43, and Alpha Company uh, I have no idea if they even made it. Any of them, you know. But uh, we we became after that we became completely combat ineffective. Uh, so they, we just got at bridges around mm. Fubai after that. Did you get wounded this, uh, another time during? Oh yeah, the yeah, I got wounded my second time. Is that two Purple Hearts at this point? Oh yeah, yeah. Tell them how you got wounded. Yeah, tell us about this day. Uh, but, but the second time second I got wounded. Second Purple Heart. Yeah. Oh, that was that was in way. Uh, I was. I, I, I got hit up here in the arm and, mm -hmm. and, and, and on top of the head. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it wasn't, the wounds weren't bad, they just bled a lot, you know. Oh boy. I got, this is just a, scalp wounds it looks like really yeah. bad, but it was just a scalp wound. But, mm -hmm. yeah. Man, you thought I got a bullet right through the head, you know. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. It just started pouring <laughs> down the side of my face, you know. So is that what blinded you? That uh, started it, yeah, you know. So it impacted your optic nerves by yeah, the head and, and, and I, I developed what they call uh, traumatic cataracts too, f due to the extreme trauma to my head, mm. and uh, and uh, I had my cataracts removed, but then it, I got this macular generated my optic nerve, like I said, started to deteriorate my right eye. Yeah. So I, the optic nerve, just killed, but no, the pressure got too high, and so they removed my right eye altogether. It's a false eye I have there. Mm -hmm. And my left eye, I have acute glaucoma also, which is my optic nerve and, and uh, macular degeneration. And it's, I just started going blind about eight, nine years ago, mm -hmm. and it's been a slow, slow, slow. John, this is this has been fascinating to hear these these stories. This is going to this is I hope your family, uh, people that you may you may never meet that will that will listen to this and see this, they'll be amazed. And thank you for sharing that. Tell us about once you left the Marine Corps. I, I take it, did you get evacuated back again after that second? Uh, oh yeah, I, I, they finally sent me home for, okay. after that last one. Uh, did you do any of these things by then? They were doing a lot of things in Japan and other places. Or did you get to go right back to Boston again? Oh uh, no, I, I first went to uh, Yakutsk, Japan. Yeah, and I was there for you know, just just so like a you know, get around a little good, and then they. They sent me home to mm -hmm. Chelsea Naval Hospital again. There you go. Yeah. Well, tell us about after you got out of the Marine Corps, and, uh, and we all came back at the same time in our country's history to, you know, a country totally disheveled and angered by Vietnam and spit on and all those things. But tell us about what, with all these wounds and, and this recovery, was it the VA that helped you from the beginning, and have you been with mm -hmm. them? Ever yeah, since. it was. They discharged me from the Marine Corps after about. I don't know. I think they discharged me in '69, and sent me to the VA. They retired you, right? Yeah, they yeah. They were medically, med medically retired. retired. Yeah. Yeah. And so, sent me to the VA. And, and at that point, you were you an E6 at that point? No, still an E5. E5, e well, yeah. one of the more combat uh, uh, experienced E5s in the Marine Corps. Oh, I love being an E5. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I that, like being in charge. That story about the bank. You want to tell them about that crossing the street? How you had to rush across the street and you got stuck in a bank? Oh, that was, yeah. Was that in Way City? Or yeah, yeah. Had, yeah, that they was. They had real large okay. streets. It's after six, so we want to make sure you still get your meeting. But uh, all right, this is just this about only the takes, bank. Yeah. All right, but this is this. Is this. They called it, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, phase line green. 
that was written by one of our lieutenants. Yeah. Well, the phase line green was our jump off point you know, for the bat the the battle. We all got first lined up, and was it was just a street. I don't know yeah. the name of it. And they had phase line green, phase line brown, phase line gray. I guess I. I never saw any colors. <laughs> <laughs> so we were on this phase line green, and uh, Lieutenant War, he was he was uh, one of the lieutenants, and he was standing right here, and he had the red popper in his hand, and I, and I already made up my mind, I'm, I'm going I'm to be the first one across, you know, figuring, you know, that uh, they won't shoot me, they'll be seeing me going across, but they'll get the guys behind me. <laughs> 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 so. I mean, as he, as his hand, his hand came back, and I took off, and he, he, he didn't do it. He didn't launch this. No, he, 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 he chickened out, I guess, for some reason, and I took off <laughs> alone. <laughs> and I didn't know what I. So I, I see this doorway right there ahead of me, you know, and I guess I'm gonna roll right through that door, you know. Well, it was a bank. <laughs> <laughs> how, how far are we talking about? Oh, the streets. Oh, I'd say a good 30 yards. It was tree-lined, sidewalks on both sides. Mm -hmm. It was a good clip, but I only touched the ground maybe twice. <laughs> 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 but I hit the bank door so hard, and of course it was the, it was made out of those cubes of glass. Oh, know, yeah. And you couldn't get I, I, I bounced right off it. And I, but luckily it was a little cupola there. It was a, it was a little inset, luckily. So a little, little defilade position. Yeah, because a sniper opened up on me. Ah. He, but he couldn't hit me because I was in the doorway like this. But he was hitting the cornice up there, in the corner right there, across from me. And I was, oh, all this concrete was glass. Glass. trying to hit me. He was trying to ricochet it into me, you know. So all this concrete was hitting me, and all everybody's across the street going, "Come on back!" And I'm like, "Yes, <laughs> come on, yeah. get out of this alcove and come back." Whoa! So I, I, I sat there, oh geez, quite a quite a while, you know, and then uh, it looked like I could make a break when it got it got a little dark, mm -hmm. and uh, I hooked across, I hooked across the street, and we didn't do nothing until the next day, and then we started it all over again. Look at that! What a yeah. what a what an experience and. And, uh, that, it was the greatest experience of yeah, my life. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't regret it. I certainly don't. Uh, uh, it, it fulfilled everything I ever wanted. I, I, you know, I, I always wanted to be a sergeant in the Marine Corps and and lead a platoon of troops in the combat. I, and that's what I did. I just have to tell you something that I don't want to interrupt, but to say that to enlist in the Marine Corps at a time when there is a draft, you don't know what might happen with the draft, but to not even hesitate right out of high school and enlist in the Marine Corps, that's that patriotic New England red, white, and blue spirit. And uh, our country luckily has very much fewer now, but we still have some young people ready to go and ready to do that. Uh, what was the impact of having been in the Marine Corps? You were on medical retirement. Medical, uh, were you able to perform another career, do other things? What, I, I worked for the post today? office for uh -huh. uh, as a clerk, uh -huh. and so that was all right. You know, I just couldn't do any physical work mm -hmm. really. Yeah, and I worked there for a while until uh, we moved to Florida. My wife retired, and I, you know, we moved we here. moved down to Florida. Yeah. Do you have a post office pension? As well as uh, uh, I didn't work there the twenty years, so no, they just the, gave no. me what they call what they call it, severance pay. Severance pay. Yeah. Okay. It, it, but it so. sounds like you have a great wife. That uh, oh, my up. my wife is fantastic. She uh, <laughs> she's part of me, like you know. Yeah. But you didn't meet her till after you were wounded the second time. I didn't meet her until I was in the post office. Uh huh. She came in the mail. Yeah, and that was until seven, 1977. Uh huh. I, I was a. Uh, I had a, a lot of problems with PTSD after uh, mm -hmm. I got out of the hospital and stuff, and uh, I, I didn't want to settle down. I, I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't get my stuff together yet. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I didn't go to work. I didn't start working at the post office till '77, so I, mm -hmm. I, I bummed around for mm -hmm. oh, a good five years or so. You know, and uh, then I finally got my head together, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, yeah. I, I got. In, a job in the post office, and I went to Rhode Island College, under the under the uh, GI, uh, GI Bill. G, well, it was a yeah. vocational rehab program. Okay, yeah. And they they paid for all that too. That was good, you know. They yeah. paid me for that. And, uh, well, that's fantastic. Well, we're certainly glad from our perspective you decided to come to Florida, 
all the best veterans come to Florida. <laughs> and uh, uh, we appreciate it very much being able to make sure that your story is forever now uh, going to be re told. Uh, Paul will contact you when we have it done, make arrangements to get it, get it to you and your wife and pass it on. If you need an extra copy or two, we'll make that. We, all this is free. It's donated from a couple of military organizations to do all the video stuff and the discs and the mailing and everything. But um, again, to remind you, it'll be at the Library of Congress. Uh, they're about nine months behind due to COVID of putting it on the website. Uh, it'll be to you and it'll be here at the Veterans Memorial Center. Um, we uh, also want to commend you for sticking with the Marine Corps League. I know a lot of these guys, and I would never want to stick with them. But uh, I guess it's a Marine thing. <laughs> it is. It's a Marine thing. As an Army veteran, I, I can't relate. But we just have to get a couple of quick information. Paul will do that. Uh, the right to sign. Yeah. Oh, wait. Let's go ahead and we'll, we'll, end the, we'll end the interview here, if it's okay, John. Sure. By simply saying thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you for coming tonight to do this and help us spread the word to rest everybody else in the Marine Corps League. Come and do this. It's not for ourselves. It's for the families of the future, the great-grandchildren that will never know if you don't tell them. Right. All right. Thank you, Paul. I mean, John. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all. <laughs>